I'm gonna just be honest with you. Um, I don't think anybody really knows what's going on. And it is clear that we have no central place of leadership and there is no consensus on the moment that we're in. There are some people that believe that this moment is scientific or medicinal. Others believe this is political or a moment of social activism or a collective uh, spiritual awakening, uh, uh, an awakening to a different form of consciousness. Some would call it the universe. Some are calling it the living God. Others are calling it happenstance or an anomaly. And the truth is, as many human beings as exist in the world are as many opinions as we have. But the truth is, there is a truth that is, and it is bigger than all of us may be able to understand. And the fact is, we have no clarity and we need to get clear on what's happening so that we can start moving in the direction of the thing that we were created for. And the truth is, we gotta stop walking around in the fog and the clouds and we need to go ahead and get focused. We need to make a decision right now that we are gonna follow the leading and the promptings of the Holy Ghost so that we can come out of this moment with the precise plan for what God wants his church to be, what he wants his church to do, and how he wants his church to act. Now our faith has been tested. Our faith has been punched, hit, kicked, and we have now uh, uh, understood like never before the absolute reliance on the person of Jesus Christ, the power of the Holy Spirit. And if I'm talking to the right group of people, I need you to go ahead and just holler at your boy real quick. Maybe give the Lord a praise in your house and say, God, that man is speaking to me. Because the clarity that you need, I believe God has given me a word to speak to you and your family on what we need to start doing next. It's time to mobilize. It's time for us to, to get centrally located, a, a central place of understanding. But we also need to take a look back and realize that even as bad as it is and as we think it is, we came from someplace significant and God has a plan that's bigger than this moment. If you'll do me a favor and pray with me, I would certainly appreciate it. Lord, all over the world, we come to you in prayer asking for your hand of mercy, protection, favor, overflow, wisdom, discernment. God, we need you like we've never needed you before. Now the enemy has hit us with his best blows and yet here we are. And so God, if we're still standing, whether we got a busted lip or a swole eye, we're still here. And I believe that your church, and I know according to scripture, that your church is going nowhere. So get the glory and speak through your word right now. And don't let me be the weak link, but let me speak the word with power. Wake up your army and mobilize them to understand the greatness that is inherent and the dignity that comes with being called by the living God for such a time as this. Every single place of glory, praise, and honor goes to you. In Jesus' name, amen. So there's a scripture that I want to share with you, and it is 2 Timothy chapter 1. I'm reading from the New King James Version. And it's important that, I, that uh, you understand the history and context of this letter that Paul wrote to Timothy. But I want to read you the scriptures first. 2 Timothy chapter 1, starting at the third verse. And since you're sitting over there eating your cereal and not really focused, I'm going to just step over here. I'm going to talk to y'all. Because sometimes they be playing, but I know y'all all the way in there. Y'all got up early, you got your Bibles and your journals and your coffee, and you got your tea with your lemon and the chamomile. I heard some people say chamomile. It's not chamomile. You walk a mile, but you drink chamomile. Anyway, uh, 2 Timothy chapter 1, starting at the third verse, says this. I thank God, whom I serve with a pure conscience, as my forefathers did. As without ceasing, I remember you in my prayers night and day, greatly desiring to see you, being mindful of your tears, 
that I may be filled with joy when I call to remembrance the genuine faith that is in you, which dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded is in you also. Therefore, I remind you to stir up the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Let me repeat that last verse because you know we always quote it, but you needed the context to remember where it was coming from and who Paul was speaking to. For God has not given us a spirit of, oh my goodness, I don't know what's about to happen. I'm totally terrified. This don't make no sense. You've been, you've been walking with God too long to think like that. You've been walking with God too long to feel like that and to remain in that place. It's okay to visit that place, but you can't set up a permanent residence in that place. Feel the the, feel the angst, feel the anxiousness, feel the fear, feel the, 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 the moment of being scared, but then snap out of it because you have a history with God. You have, you have something uh, uh, on the inside that is persuading you that God is not going to leave you in this moment. He has brought you too far to leave you. You already knew where I was going. For God has not given us a spirit of, oh my goodness, but a power and of love and of a sound mind. Now y'all, we all in? They feelings is hurt, so let me go talk to them. So here's the thing. Timothy was the spiritual son of the apostle Paul. At the moment that Paul uh, wrote this letter, he was in a Roman prison preparing to die. Many theological minds have determined and agreed that this was the last letter that Paul wrote in his life. Now, when you're getting ready to die, the last thing you want to do is waste time on things that don't matter. Paul wrote a letter to his spiritual son to admonish him and to encourage him around his faith and around the assignment that was on his life. And I want to take a moment to tell you right now that you're not watching this sermon by accident. I know everybody's church is online and there are people who are far better at marketing and promotion than me. But I'm going to tell you this, if you're here, it's because the Holy Ghost wanted you here to watch this sermon because there is an army that God is requiring to step up into the positions that God has intended for us to be in. Romans 8, 18 and 19 makes clear that that the earth is eagerly awaiting the revealing of the sons of God. But you can't know who you are if you don't get in position to hear where you're going. So Paul wrote this letter to Timothy. And uh, you have to understand the context of the Roman government at the time. They were absolutely averse to Christians. They were blaming Christians for everything that was going wrong in Rome. Christianity was new. It was an easy scapegoat, which is so striking to me because now Rome is the seat of the Catholic Church, which honors Paul and honors Peter. But it was Rome and the Roman Emperor Nero that actually killed Paul. Nero was descending into madness. He had assumed the throne in AD 54. Uh, and then at the burning of Rome in AD 64, Christians were the scapegoat and they used Christians as bully, bully pulpits and punching bags. And it was a horrific time to be a believer because being a Christian in that moment could very well cost you your life and cost many Christians their lives in very horrific ways. Not just crucifixion, but many Christians were literally put as lampposts in Roman cities and were set on fire. That's where we get the word Roman candles. Christians were set on fire as lampposts in a city. This was really happening. 
The reason why I'm bringing this up is because in this day of casual Christianity, in this day of safe church, in this day of I don't know what I'm doing, I'm inconvenienced, we don't go to buildings. Do you understand we come from a history of people who lost their lives, they were sawed in two, they were boiled in oil, and worse for the gospel, and we're upset because we can't get into a building? You need to thank God that you have the freedom and the ability to to come and go as you please, to profess your faith as you please. And what you need to be doing and what I need to be doing is thanking God that he chose us to be able to perpetuate the truth of the gospel in this moment because there are saints that we will meet in heaven that wish they had the freedoms and the liberties that we have to be able to share the gospel without the immediate fear of death. God, I thank you that you chose me for this moment, this dispensation in history. Paul knew that he was going to die. And as he was preparing to die, he had enough foresight to write a letter to his spiritual son to let him know that you are the continuation of my work. And so Timothy uh, was now stationed in Ephesus and he had been doing work for about three years. And he had been on missionary journeys with Paul, so he knew him. There was a relationship there. And one of the things that I hope that you're doing in this uh, COVID-19 pandemic isolation moment is not lamenting the loss of your freedoms, uh, but literally taking time to get in the word like never before, to, 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 to study God's word, to sit in his presence. And here's the thing that I've learned about God. There are some things that he will download in silence that he will never do in the noise. Do not adjust your screen. I was silent on purpose. We know how to talk, but very rarely do we know how to listen. Because in this season, this is not about talking, it's about listening. It's about listening to God. It's about hearing from him. It's about doing the thing that he tells us to do in the moment that he tells us to do it. Precise instruction for the moment we're in. And God so loved Timothy that he allowed Paul to write him specific instructions on how to prepare for what was coming next. And so here Paul is writing and he says, Timothy... I need you to hold on to your faith that was first in your grandmother Lois and then your mama Eunice and then passed on to you, activated by the laying on of my hands. Paul knew that his life was coming to an end and he did not want the work to end because his season was up. Let me admonish every Christian leader that has some sense of insecurity because the church as we knew it has shifted in a new direction. Hallelujah. Your insecurities are unwelcome in this moment of necessity. We must be like the Apostle Paul, identifying, equipping, and celebrating the next generation. I'm 46 years old, man. I'll be 47 not many days from now if the Holy Spirit is kind and allows me to live. What do I look like trying to compete with a 23-year-old preacher who's coming up into the faith and I'm, I'm hoping that I can be as cool and as savvy as him? That means I didn't embrace who God made me to be. I need to be okay with who I am and you need to be okay with who you are. It's so important for you to celebrate what God is doing next so you can still be relevant in the now. Just because I don't do what everybody else does doesn't make, make me fall behind. It doesn't make me uh, irrelevant. It makes me me. And everybody has a role to play. And I need to play my position. And the moment I run around in my insecurity trying to fill everybody else's position, then my calling goes lacking. Paul was in a prison. He said, I got to get a letter to my spiritual son. And I need to remind him of something. I need to remind him that the moment that he's in is going to actually become more difficult. We we learn later in the book of Hebrews that Timothy was actually imprisoned for a season. 
See, I think we as believers have gotten this thing wrong because Western Christianity causes us to believe that we're somehow in the majority and we're welcomed. Let me tell you something. Our faith is under attack. And those of us who are believers are going to see those attacks begin to intensify according to the word of God, according to scripture, and we should not be caught off guard by that. And so if you are one of those uh, candy Christians, sweet tooth Christians that only want the good stuff, you're going to be messed up when the tribulations start coming. You better just go ahead and knuck if you buck. You need to go ahead and get ready for a real fight. This is not peacetime. It's wartime. Paul said, I don't want you to lose heart and I need you to go ahead and remember your faith. And I need you to go ahead and know that it didn't start with you. The one thing I need you to get in your spirit is this didn't start with you. So don't let it end with you. The legacy and the lineage and the calling that is on your life, it didn't start with you. So don't let it end with you. Everybody say Lois, Eunice, Timothy. And if you're going to grab this word, if I was going to title it, and I'm already halfway home, I would entitle it Granny's Recipe. Granny's Recipe. So there was a woman named Lois. We don't know much about her. We just know that her grandson was Timothy. We don't know a lot about Eunice. We just know she had a son named Timothy. But what we do know is whatever Timothy was was reconciled through the faith of his mother Eunice and his grandmother Lois. And there's something about Granny's, something about Granny's cooking that tastes better than anybody else's, something about going to Granny's house that makes you feel closer to home. It, 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 it feels like the genesis. I, don't, I know I'm not the only one. It's just something about Granny. And I was blessed to have uh, spent time with both of my grandmothers on my father's side and on my mother's side. On my father's side, my, my, my grandmother was an unbelievable gourmet level cook. She would make the best yeast rolls, oh my God, that you have ever had in your life. I could smell the yeast and I could smell the rolls rising. Wasn't no microwaves in her house. She didn't do microwaves. Everything was from scratch, homemade. And I remember me and my mother would go over there for holidays and she'd be cooking. Somebody give me a pot, please give me a pan. Hook me up, Larry. My man, come say hi to the people. You ain't gonna say hi? All right. <laughs> so, she would be on the stove. Every burner would have something on it. Not no electric stove. You understand me? Not with the electric stove with the thing. And, no, no. This was heat. You feel that steam heat coming? That's your undercarriage. She'd be in there, she'd be cooking. And let me tell you something, when she was getting good, one hand was on the hip, the other hand was stirring. See, because when you put your hand on your hip, you're thinking about that thing. And then she would, she would go and get some spices. And she popped the spices in and she put the ingredients in. And I remember asking my grandmother, Granny, what you cooking? And she'd tell me I'm cooking yams or, or macaroni and cheese. I'm putting it in. I'm going to put it in the oven or whatever. And I always ask for the recipe. And she'd look at me. She says, a good cook never tells. And one of the challenges with us is we get upset because the cook, the living God, through the person of the Holy Spirit, doesn't always tell us what he's cooking. And the biggest challenge is the ingredients don't seem to make sense. Because what you need to know is that what God is making out of you is a recipe that's never been seen before. And you are looking at somebody else's kitchen trying to figure out how come you don't look like that and how come your dish didn't come out like that and how come it didn't taste the same. But God used different ingredients to make you than he did to make someone else. See, because some people are a souffle and they look good in a moment, but all it takes is a little bit of a challenge and they will literally shrink right in front of you. Uh, but God, he expertly crafted all the ingredients of your life and it didn't always feel good. A little bit of rejection, a little bit of misunderstanding. There was some insecurity. Oh, let's not forget that good old abandonment. Let's stir that in there. Yeah. Oh, let's forget those busted relationships. 
Can't forget that. Mm-hmm. Oh, let's get a little sorrow. Let's get some acquainted with grief going. Yeah, let's start at mmm. It tastes bitter, so we're going to need to put something else in there to balance it out. And even through the negative things that were the ingredients of who God made you, then he began to put some other ingredients. Let me put some hope in there. Let me put some joy in there. Let me put some, let me put some freedom in there. Oh, let me stir this a little bit. I need to pour some deliverance in there. Yeah, because whom the sun sets free is free indeed. You got delivered from that thing that tried to hold you hostage. Oh, yeah. And then, oh, 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 oh. the joy of the Lord is your strength. So he put a little bit of some extra strength, laughter in there. So he gave you a great personality so you could get your laugh back. Why are you so deep? You saved and you can't laugh? You remember the lunch lady? The lunch lady never laughed. Always had that thing on her head. You want some more green beans or not? Get out my line. I'm sick of it. It's the difference between the cook and the one that receives it. It's hard to cook it, but it's good when it comes out. I need you to know that God put you in the oven. He baked you at 400 degrees for 30 years or 20 years or 10 years because he wanted to make sure that when you came out of the oven, you were not a souffle, but you were an entree. That people could dine on the reality of your life and the lessons of your life and they would be better because they had encountered you. And Paul was telling Timothy, the things that you walked through did not start with you. It started with your granny. She was in the kitchen called faith. She was in the kitchen called long suffering. She was in the kitchen called prayer and she had a faith that would endure. She had a faith that increased and she had a faith that transferred. And that's what we need now is a faith that endures, a faith that increases, and a faith that transfers. Hallelujah. And see, the best recipes are those that are improvisational. Tell somebody, use what you got. See, when Granny kept cooking, I always wanted the recipe, but it was in her head. It wasn't written down. You know, I don't know what she did with them rolls, but I know Jesus put his finger in that batter. Those rolls are the best thing that the Lord ever made. And so she would stir. But you got to improvise. That means the way it looks may not be what it is. Now, normally I use a towel, but today I improvised. <laughs> that ain't no scarf. That's a paper towel. See, I had to improvise because God is cooking up something new. And here's the thing. Thank you, Larry. No, I'm good. Just because you have to improvise doesn't mean that the dish is going to be messed up. Because some of you are saying, I didn't have all the ingredients. I didn't have a father in the house. My mother abandoned me. I don't come from a legacy of faith. Well, guess what? The Bible says that this legacy that Timothy was a part of started with Lois, which means she was the first of her kind. So if you are the first in your family, <laughs> bravo. And praise God for your commitment to the gospel. And if nobody before you has a legacy of faith, then guess what? Don't let it end with you. But you got to know who you are. Are you a Lois? Are you a Eunice? Are you a Timothy? Lois started it, but Eunice was the bridge. Now, I believe I'm a Eunice. I'm a bridge builder. I'm a bridge between what the church was and to the Timothys, what the church is supposed to be. And I know that that is a difficult calling because when you're in the middle, sometimes those of us who are in the middle don't get the credit because if you're a bridge, you get walked on. Woo! They don't realize the necessity of a bridge till the bridge breaks down. So to all of my bridge builders, don't break down in this moment. To all of my bridge builders, don't break down in this season. To all of my bridge builders, don't let this moment become the moment that causes everything uh, uh, to fall apart. Hold on to all of our bridge builders. Fight the good fight to all of our bridge builders. Keep your faith to all of my bridge builders. Keep being the one that holds on to the faith of your grandmother, your grandparents, your forefathers, and then extend yourself so that the Timothys of the world can know that you come from something. That's why it's important to go from our contemporary worship to hymns. Don't be so deep that you stop singing them hymns. 
Every now and then, you need to remember the lineage that you come from. See, Lois, she was the originator. Eunice was the bridge builder. And Timothy was the byproduct. He was the, the baton holder. Paul knew he was about to die. Nero was going to behead him. And here at the end of his life, he said, I need you to stir up the gift. Right now, I need somebody all over the world, Rock family, to stir up the gift to the global church. Stir up the gift. I need you right now to start worshiping in your house. Start worshiping in your car. Start worshiping wherever you are. I want you to stir up the gift. We've got enough people that are hurting and wounded. We need an army to understand who you are. Timothy was young, but he was ready. And Paul says, my time is up and your time is now. And Timothy, I already laid hands on you, but I need you to know that you come from a legacy of faith. So I want to give you a couple of small points. And I hope that this is important to you. Second Timothy, at the end of the letter, Paul says, I fought the good fight. I ran my race. I kept the faith. This is juxtaposed against what he said to Timothy in his first letter. He told Timothy, fight the good fight. I need you to get this. He was telling Timothy, fight. At the beginning of his ministry and at the end of his life, he said, Timothy, I fought. What he was saying is, let me lead you by example. We need those who have gone through different challenges and trials and have come out with victories and war stories about how God brought them through, you need to, you need to share because we overcome by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. Paul said, I fought the good fight. I, I ran my race. I kept my faith. Now you do the same, Timothy. Then he also says, hey, be careful about this guy named Demas. He did much harm to me and he left me. He abandoned me and went to Thessalonica. What he was saying is, everybody that's around you isn't for you. I need you to get that all the way in your spirit. And just because you're near me doesn't mean you're with me. And what Paul was saying is, it's going to get treacherous. And don't be deceived. Everybody is not all happy to see you successful. Everybody's not going to celebrate what God is doing in you. But they can't stop what God is doing in you. So walk in your anointing, but also walk in wisdom so you know who everybody is. So there's three things I want you to keep, and I'm going to let you go. If you're really going to get into Granny's recipe of faith, of works, of commitment, of a faith that endures, I want you to understand the first thing is don't forget your lineage. Don't forget where you come from. See, I didn't just pop up into my faith. My faith came from my mother, Alice. And her faith came from her mama, my grandmother, Mame. Mame Davis and Alice Gray. And so I got Lois, I got Eunice, and I'm Timothy. And let me tell you something. I'm not here without the faith of Mame, Alice. I'm not here. So even though you didn't know Maine Davis, you see her fruit. You may not know Alice Gray, but you see her fruit. People may not know your grandmother, your aunt, your cousin, your father, or whoever it was that pushed you into this moment, but they will see the fruit. See, I come from something. That's why I can't give up now. And yes, I've wanted to give up. Yes, I've wanted to quit. And so have you. But this moment has actually awakened the beast that's on the inside of me. You understand what I'm saying, cuz? I can't die right now. I come from people that came through worse, had less, and believed for more. And now we're going to see an abundance of harvest and overflow that we've never seen. More resources coming into the kingdom than in any other moment in history. I declare a supernatural influx of resources, millions upon billions upon trillions of dollars into the people of God's hands so that we can perpetuate the gospel all over the world. Now, I need everybody all over the relentless online community and the global church to give God a 15-second praise break. Glory! Hallelujah! Thank you, Jesus! Hallelujah! Focus. 
Stay focused. Make sure your praise stays in focus. Make sure your hallelujahs stay in focus. Make sure your life stays in focus. Don't forget your lineage. I come from somewhere. Now I got my own Timothy. I got a son. I got a daughter that I got to pass this down to. So Timothy becomes Eunice and Eunice becomes Lois and we go from generation to generation. Hallelujah. That's why he's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and so on and so on and so on. Number two, determined to forge a legacy. In this moment of my life, I don't want my faith to end with me. So the way I live my life and the way I govern myself will determine what happens from here. I'm going to forge a legacy. My children are going to be stronger believers. They're going to be better human beings, better citizens of this global community with more empathy and a listening ear. That is what I want my legacy to be, that I lifted up Jesus with the life that I lived and the fruit that was produced through a life of obedience. Granny's recipe is lineage, legacy, and finally, dedicate yourself to learning. You know, Timothy was always connected to Paul. We don't talk about Paul without Timothy. He was committed to learning. Do you think that there was a better teacher to build the church than Paul? Timothy, man. He had the best professor that ever existed. And he was dedicated to learning. He stayed with him for 10 years. 10 years! The least you can do for two months is get in the word. <laughs> Stay in a word. Dedicate yourself to learning. Get some books around the word. We're in a different season now. Paul knew he was dying. When he died, it was on Timothy. We just lost one of the greatest Christian minds of the last 400 years, if you ask me. Dr. Ravi Zacharias transitioned. And the one that he spoke of so eloquently, he's now in the presence of. And it leaves a gaping hole, in my estimation, in the body of Christ. But God has somebody in the earth that's supposed to pick up that mantle. And I believe it doesn't fall to one person, it falls to many. And so now, what are you going to do? Granny's recipe, all of the ingredients that made you, the pain, the tears, the suffering, the sorrow, the joy, the, the learning, the, the, the happiness, all of it together has baked you. And while my, my father's mother was a great cook, my mother's mother was a woman of God unlike anything I've ever seen. And both of them were women of faith, but one of them needed faith a little more than the other, and I learned. And I learned from Mame Davis, and I learned from Alice Gray. I also gleaned from my other grandmother, Celestine Gray. But now I'm my own man. Truth is, I had borrowed my mom's faith, but now I had to buy my own. So it's my turn to build my own relationship with Jesus. Don't forget your lineage. Determine to forge a legacy and dedicate yourself to learning. I think that's the recipe. The truth is, y'all, when I think about my grandmother, Maine, she didn't have a lot of education, but she was a lifelong learner. She was an inventor, an entrepreneur, way ahead of her time, 60, 70 years ahead of her time. And I believe God is going to fulfill the promise of her legacy through Timothy. Lois, Eunice, Timothy. And as I end this message, I pray that you identify which moment you're in. Because if you live your life right, you're one of the three. <laughs> but it's nothing better than Granny's cooking. Oh God. But the only thing better than Granny's cooking is when Daddy puts it together sits at the table and says, come dine. So your heavenly father now tells you, come and dine. The table is ready. The world is waiting on you. So since the world is waiting on you, 
what in the world are you waiting for? Let's pray. Lord, seal this word. Bless your people. And thank you that you put the recipe together so that we can be to this generation what we're called to be. Thank you for the faith legacy that has birthed us. Let us not forget it. Let it not end with us in Jesus' name. Amen. If you will do me a favor for those who have never given your life to Jesus, I want you to know that because of his death, burial, and resurrection, you have the opportunity to live a legacy, a supernatural legacy of faith, a supernatural legacy of relevance. Pray with me. If you need a savior like I did, pray this prayer. Lord Jesus, it's me. I confess with my mouth and believe in my heart that Jesus is Lord. Thank you for the blood that was shed for me. I receive the free gift of salvation, not through my works, but the finished work of the cross. The blood is enough to pay for my sins. I am made new. Now, Holy Spirit, come live inside and teach me the ways of Jesus so that I look like him more each and every day. This is my prayer. You are my savior and my Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. I believe if you prayed that prayer, not only are you saved, but you've been given the gift of the Holy Spirit. And I wanna thank you for spending time with your church family today and with me. And I pray that the blessings of God will overtake you. And I hope that you will trace back your history and look at the lineage and look at where you come from, see your place in history and this moment in time and determine to leave a legacy and a lineage while you continue to learn. This is my prayer for you. And thank you for your generosity to our church, to this community, and your commitment to the kingdom. So may the Lord bless you and keep you, cause his face to shine upon you. May the Lord our God be gracious to you, show you his favor, and give you his peace. I love y'all. What's going on, family? It's Pastor John Gray, and I just want to say thank you for watching this message. I want you to know that Relentless is always here every Sunday morning, 8.30 a.m. and 11 a.m. It means the world that you are a part of our family, grateful for your life. And if you were blessed, please click the subscribe button and share with a friend or a family member who you feel could benefit from hearing this amazing message from Pastor John. You blessed me with this one. It was fantastic. Well, that means the world because you know my wife tells the truth. And listen, we want to thank you for being a part not only by watching, but by your generosity. And if this message blessed you, click the give button and whatever the Lord puts on your heart, we are grateful because it will allow us to continue to share the love of Jesus with the whole world. We love you. We appreciate you. Thank you for being a part of our Relentless family. God bless you.